All right, students, we have a chapter four, lesson two, which is the history of East Asia. And this is most likely going to be a long one because we're dealing with six countries here and thousands of years of history. Uh, we could spend literally the rest of the year just talking about East Asia and its history. Uh, and obviously we don't have time for that. So let's jump in here and we're gonna get started. Uh, one of the first things you need to realize is that we divide time into um, used to be BC and AD. Now we use terms before common era and common era. And why we come about those is that China's history spans such a long period of time. So around 10,000 BCE is when, uh, so that's before common era. That's when people started settling near the river, the Huanhe. And then about 3,000 years later in 7,000 BC, farming communities started to develop. Um, around this river, which is a 3,000 year period of time, long time to, for farming to develop. Um, that's because we talked about this in class, that farming is tough and difficult. So it took a long time for people to rely on that instead of hunting and gathering. And this would give way to uh, cities and that would bring in many of those elements of culture that we've talked about and the structure of government. So civilization arrives uh, and the civilization for China uh, a lot of aspects are really unchanged, just things as like their language. So it's about 4,000 years old. We can say that China has the longest continuous history um, in the world. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating. Uh, and we're going to use this term dynasties for both Japan and China. And a dynasty is a line of rulers that come from the same family. Uh, both China and Japan had dynasties. Uh, one of the most interesting thing about China is that its first dynasty is the Xia dynasty, X-I-A. I know it doesn't look like it would be pronounced that way. But one of the most interesting things is that they don't really know if it existed or not. Uh, it very well could be uh, almost like legend, fictitious, uh, created to make an example of what all other rulers should aspire to be. So there's never been any evidence. There's no primary sources that have been found to show that the Xia dynasty uh, is actually exists. So it very much could be a myth. Um, but that brings us into the uh, first actual dynasty that we have record of, and that is the Shang dynasty. And developed the writing system, uh, a calendar, even the use of chopsticks. Um, you know, you're going to see a lot of things about the Chinese and their inventions. So um, you're not going to have to know specific dynasties, but just knowing their names are kind of important. Uh, we've talked a little bit, some of these slides, and I'm going to breeze over some of them, talk about the uh, difference in uh, writing from Chinese to Korean to Japanese. Uh, and Chinese is a very, very difficult language. So this slide deals with about 80,000 characters. And to really be fluent, you need to be able to write four to four to 8,000 characters, which, you know, we only have to know 26 letters of the alphabet in English. Um, so Chinese is a very, very difficult language to be able to write correctly. Uh, the next dynasty here is the Zhao dynasty, uh, Z-H-O-U. Uh, and this is when a lot of uh, more inventions came in that they created coins. Uh, they first invented the plow. Um, and it's the longest dynasty, uh, lasting for uh, almost 800 years. And you can see the territory that they controlled, which is not nearly all of China today. Um, but still, that's a, a very large area. This is whenever the belief systems of Confucius, who is a teacher and philosopher, um, that's whenever he lived and his ideas were adopted and then would become very fundamental in, in China society from then on out. Uh, there are other beliefs there as well. Uh, Taoism and Taoism um, also came about. And we'll see a slide on that here in a second. Uh, the mandate of heaven was really important to uh, Chinese government uh, because this is what gave the emperor the power to rule. And if things were going well in the country, there were no natural disasters, there was no uprisings from the people, then the ruler maintained power because he had the mandate of heaven. The, the gods were um, shining brightly upon them. But if things started to happen, they would lose power. And so this cycle right here that's shown a new dynasty brings peace and structure and gives lands to the peasants. And then eventually things start happening. There's taxes. Uh, they could treat people unfairly. But then the, the, they, would, they would associate these things with peasant revolts and floods and earthquakes. And they would lose that mandate of heaven. And then there would be a war. There would be unrest and a new power would come to uh, be, and usually ran by a new family, and that's what created the new dynasty. Um, 
So uh, that's just kind of mandate of heaven will be on the test. That's an important component here. Uh, I already mentioned Confucius. Uh, people need to be morally good. Um, and then under Taoism is this Lao Tzu, I believe is how you pronounce that, uh, which is this idea of the way. So these were kind of the major belief systems uh, in uh, Chinese philosophy. Uh, the next dynasty is an important one too. Uh, Q-I-N, pronounced Qin, and that's actually where we get the name China from. Actually comes from this word uh, Qin, and it was the first to unify uh, China under a single government. The emperor uh, uh, mentioned here, uh, Qin Shi Huan is uh, the one who kind of like brought all of the country together under one government. This is when also uh, the band construction on the Great Wall of China. Uh, the Han Dynasty, a lot of Chinese people today are uh, identify as Han Chinese. So this word Han comes up several times. Uh, this is when paper was invented. And still, we're talking about long before paper was ever created in Europe. Um, so pretty fascinating. Uh, they did some bronze work here. I think we're seeing that here. And then the Silk Road uh, really was a path. You'll see it on the next slide here. So the Silk, Silk Road ran all the way from Europe to Asia. Um, so it's this trade route, really important to spread um, not only things from Asia to Europe, but also Europe to Asia as well. Um, so that's a really important route, and that usually is on our test as well. The next dynasty is the Tang Dynasty. This is when woodblock printing was created. Uh, Gunpowder was, gun was also invented. So just Chinese dynasties, every one of them seemed to kind of add something to it. Um, I also want to make sure we talk about the Yuan dynasty here briefly because the Yuan were not Chinese. They were the Mongols. So the Mongols coming out of Mongolia, led by Genghis Khan. He was the first to kind of unite uh, all of, uh, of, of the Mongol people together, and then they conquered much of Asia. This is the, la the largest uh, empire ever built by any group was the Mongols. Um, they were uh, interesting in a lot of ways, um, and I don't know if the slide kind of deals with this. I don't think it talks about that, but they really kind of let a lot of the structure remain, like people could have their same belief systems. Um, you know, they, they reconnected the Silk Road, um, but they just really conquered a lot of Asia. Um, we'll do an activity in class so you can see the map and how much territory they, they, um, they controlled. Um, you know, the people really weren't happy because the Mongols weren't Chinese. Um, and after Genghis Khan dies, really the, the empire begins to fall apart as far as the territory that they conquered. Um, Korea. Korea is interesting. We know of North and South Korea. It hasn't always been that way. Um, there were several different kingdoms that existed here. Um, and that's the way it was for many, many years. Uh, these, some of these things you get filled in in your notes. I'm going to just kind of breeze past them. Um, but like Korea is obviously different than China. I think sometimes we kind of think, you know, all these areas are connected, but there were se separate belief systems, separate languages, uh, but many influences of from one to the other. Um, this is about the Chinese, uh, well, the Korean writing system, which isn't nearly as complex. So we're going to kind of breeze, breeze past that, 24 characters in that. Um, we'll come back to Korea. Mainly I want to talk about kind of what happens to create North and South Korea. Uh, so Japan... Um, one of the first things we need about, there's all these different periods uh, of Japan's history, writing was created, um, and of Japanese writing. So here we get to the this word shogun, or the shogunite, uh, and they were military rulers, and then the samurai were like these, uh, they supported the shogun. And really, over time, they began to be the ones that controlled the power, not so much the emperor. They were kind of like the advisors to the emperor. Um, and the term samurai means those who serve. And at first, they were very like military based, you know, soldiers that fought. Maybe you've seen the, the armor that they wore, which are like these braided um, kind of like plates that they wore, all of them really fascinating. Uh, they lived by this code called the Shidu, um, which is like a code of honor. Uh, and loyalty, especially to the Shogun, uh, and they played a key role. Uh, samurai history is really, really fascinating to me. I love to kind of talk about that. Um, 
but eventually the samurai are going to kind of phase out uh, and we'll get to that when we kind of get into modern. So now we're going to kind of move into talking a little bit more about some modern uh, changes that happened to bring uh, China and Japan and Korea into the modern era. Um, so it was around three, 1300 uh, CE here. So still, you know, a long time ago, you know, it's like 700 years. Um, but the capital was moved uh, and it was established in Beijing. It was known as Peking at one point. And this is where you find the Forbidden City, which is where um, the emperor would have lived. Uh, it's a major tourist destination today. Um, videos here. And then we have the Qing Dynasty. It was the last dynasty in China's history uh, because it's going to get overthrown. And that's when communism is going to come into place in 1911. Uh, so this is the last dynasty that existed. Now China has kind of hit its more uh, modern shape, as we see in the map here. So there were a lot of internal problems, uh, and this picture kind of shows this. These are like the other world superpowers. We have like England here and Russia uh, and Japan, um, and I believe this is Germany. And so they're they're basically deciding how China is going to get divided up. And you can see the Chinese guy there, the emperor saying, hey, wait, 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 because uh, they didn't want to have a say in it. And, and so there became a lot of unrest. And when you have unrest, it leads to often rebellions. And so we see that here with the Boxer Rebellion, which ultimately failed. Um, but this is going to lead um, to a, a revolt in 1911 that overthrew the Qing um, dynasty. And in 1927, there was a military leader named Chiang Kai-shek, and he was a nationalist. And this is really important because the nationalists are going to go against the communists. So nationalists kind of favored more like democracy, republic and communism doesn't doesn't favor that well Chiang Kai-shek is going to be kind of like removed uh and he's going to leave and go to Taiwan and establish the government there um and that leaves communism to take over China and that's actually what's going to happen that uh China will be known as the People's Republic of China and it's communist Taiwan little tiny island is also known as the Republic of China it's better to call it Taiwan so we don't get confused. And it will be more of a democracy because that's where uh, the leader of that nationalist group went. Uh, the leader of uh, communism was Mao Zedong, a pretty famous leader in Chinese history. Uh, and he ushers in a lot of these uh, control of government, the economic goods. We've already talked kind of about the structure of communism. Um, and so that's going to kind of meet, make these two areas separate from one another. Um, kind of transitioning here to uh, modern Japanese history, uh, the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, by the early 1600s, Jap Japan's rulers had begun to fear Europeans. Uh, and so they basically isolated themselves. For 200 years, they kind of closed themselves off. And this is kind of around the time that like the United States becomes a country. And they like just European books were banned. They didn't trade with the outside world. Uh, and that begins to change in 1854 when the U.S. arrives with warships and kind of demands uh, that they open up their uh, uh, borders to trade. Uh, and they agree to this because they want to avoid war. Uh, and then not long after that, they are the, the rebel samurai make the Tokugawa shogunate return the power back to the emperor. Um, so kind of interesting kind of play out of, of, of the history there. Um, and then after this time, Japan really begins to modernize. There's some wars that are fought, um, but it, it, it greatly begins to develop and expand. Uh, it conquers even places in, in China and begins to take over. And then this kind of leads into um, them getting involved in World War II. And so they bomb Pearl Harbor which is in Hawaii, a U.S. base there. And this brings about a war now, not just between, um, you know, Germany and Italy, uh, Russia, France, United States. There's a war going on in Europe. But now Japan joins the side of Germany and um, Italy. And they're, now the United States is fighting on two fronts. They're fighting in the Pacific against Japan. And then they're also fighting in the Western Front uh, in Europe. And that was really, really difficult. 
And so there's a lot of history we could go in here, a lot of battles. The Battle of Midway, there's a movie released recently. I haven't watched it yet, about the Battle of Midway when there's this turning point in the war. Uh, the, the Japanese uh, war in the Pacific was extremely bloody. Uh, maybe you've heard about like Iwo Jima uh, or uh, there was battles on Okinawa, but those are listed right here. Um, and the Japanese were just extremely difficult to defeat uh, and really just bloody warfare. And so uh, you can see kind of those battles mentioned uh, and listed here. So too, in the war, the United States made the decision to drop two atomic bombs. They dropped one, demanded Japan surrender. Japan did not surrender. Three days later, they dropped another bomb. Uh, and they were extremely devastating on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and at that point, Japan surrenders uh, in the war. And um, this is going to kind of bring us into uh, talking about, I already kind of talked about the slide with the two Chinas. We got the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China. So I'm going to kind of breeze past that since we've already kind of talked about it. Um, I don't think there's anything there. Kind of want to finish talking about, oh yeah. So Japan, uh, because it had controlled part of Korea, when the war ended, um, it kind of became necessary to decide, okay, what's going to happen with Korea? And this is really interesting. So the Soviet Union, who was an ally of the United States during World War II, said, hey, we'll take, and they kind of set up in the North, uh, North Korea, and they kind of helped create structure there, and the United States set up in South Korea. And this created a divide for the first time in uh, Korean history between North Korea and South Korea. Now one is going to kind of go more communist, in North Korea, and one is going to go um, more towards democracy. And this is going to lead into conflict, and then the Korean War is going to be fought in the early 1950s. And what this did is it kind of solidified those tensions between the two, um, uh, between between the, the both those, and probably more so made the United States even more an enemy of North Korea because of all the bombings and things that happened there. And so today there is a demilitarized zone set up at the 38th parallel. Um, that's the 38th line of latitude uh, on the map. And these two countries are separated and you can't pass from one country into the other. Um, you know, most countries you can travel from one to the other with proper documentation. You can't really do that. There's armed borders. Uh, you know, they have guards set up there. Uh, just a really interesting thing that we'll talk more about in lesson three. Um, so kind of back to Japan, um, Japan is defeated after the war. They lose territories uh, because of that. But um, it's amazing. They like reinvent themselves and they really dedicate themselves to developing their economy. Uh, they uh, adopted a constitution uh, and began to really modernize. And so you might think, oh, well, these bombs were dropped and Japan is defeated, but um, th they become a world power again, uh, especially in the form of like technology and business. Uh, and, you know, many of the electronics developed today come out of Japan. Um, so that's, that's the history. I mean, when I know that's a lot of information. We've talked about everything from the Korean War and World War II to the samurai and even the first people in China. So it's a lot kind of key ideas there are definitely understanding what a dynasty is. Uh, understanding, you know, the importance of the Silk Road connecting uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, people like Genghis Khan would be really important to know because he was that Mongol that un unified all of Asia, just controlled almost the entire thing. Um, so some really big ideas there. Um, make sure you filled in the note sheet. If there are things that you still don't have done, I encourage you to either go back here, but the best way to probably do it is to just bring up the notes separately and fill any of those gaps in. But that will do it for the history of East Asia. Thanks for watching.